Hey guys, welcome to the channel, as you see in the thumbnail what if, Issa met old dragon master him. Before I start, please do support for more awesome content, and subscribe my channel and like this video. Go support and follow the Ilalugal for writing that awesome fanfic, and also make sure to comment on this story, link in the description. Let's start this video. So pitch black is only thing I can more or less see, huh? A young man looked at his surroundings and thought with sarcasm. Great. My vision is blurry, my senses are twisted and my mind well, just by the fact that I am speaking like this is proof enough that I'm not well. The brown-haired boy thought to himself while hoping that a certain someone would say something, anything at all at his comment. Waiting for a little while, praying for the dragon's voice to be heard he instead got silence. Praying. Kind of ironic if you think about it, knowing he is a devil or well, was. Yet praying for the answers from his friend, what would others say? But, how did he manage to stop being a devil? How could that happen? It didn't make sense. The evil pieces inside of him were linked to his body and more than that, to his emotions, feelings and to his soul. Removing them was akin to suicide. But the fact that he was breathing and sweating heavily proved otherwise. With his vision returning and more or less stable, he remembered where he was. A normal looking cave. Well, you could say that if you ignored how awful the location actually was. It was filled with holes, cracks, rubble and rocks. A really a terrible place to be at. Each crack was as long as an arm and the holes were of various sizes, from not bigger than a coin, to almost the size of a full human adult. How the cave was still standing and not actually destroyed was a mystery no one wanted to solve. Leading into the depths of that same cave you could distinguish, if you had a decent sight, a boy with wounds horrible enough to make the best doctors pale in fright. He was laying down in a pool of his own blood, inside a small crater not bigger than the boy himself. If you looked close enough, right onto his body, you could find eight wounds in the size and shape of a small billiard ball. Among them, the most prominent ones being right on his dot. Those wounds were three holes, all taking the shape of an inverse triangle. They were filled with blood that had yet to coagulate, and charred pieces of meat that were still falling off his body and onto the ground. A sight that would make everyone think, how was the boy even alive? Of course, that's not counting the other wounds in his arms, legs and abdomen respectively. Shit. Just how did that happen? I mean, Drake did tell me how my own power and the pieces started to fight among each other, but I never thought it would be that violent. He was shocked to say the least. Well, at least I managed to get rid of them with an exhausted voice the boy said to himself as he tried to stand up, but failing every attempt he did. His body was far too damaged to do something, at least, for now. Ah he sighed while giving up. It seems that I need to stay still until this starts acting up. The boy then gazed at his body, he was being covered with a really difficult to explain, substance. The substance was jet black in color with a tiny bit of red, glowing with an eerie purple light at small intervals. It moved as if it had a mind of its own and looked soft to the touch. However, the atmosphere of the substance itself was heavy and made the surrounding area experience a decrease in temperature. This darkness, as he decided to call it, was something he gained that fateful day a few months ago, a Friday if his memory wasn't wrong. According to the information he and Drake managed to figure out, this was the manifestation of his draconian power. When Drake told him that with a voice filled with pride and glee, he made a stupid expression. He didn't really understand what it meant. After the loud laugh of his partner, the dragon calmed himself down and started to explain, something he truly was grateful for. According to his explanation, every dragon whether high or low class, has something that differentiates themselves from other dragons and other species in general. That being, the manifestation of their aura. Not understanding much about it, he asked the dragon to simplify it for him. Knowing that his partner wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, he explained it with simple words and simple terms. Every dragon has something called aura. You could call it the nucleus of every dragon, their heart and the source of their powers, so to speak. Once a dragon manages to grow to an extremely old age, or experiences something that manages to change his or her own psyche. Then, their aura would change and they would gain certain characteristics, each one different from other dragons. Those same characteristics would then help the dragon grow at a monstrous pace even among their own kind, and give them a certain advantage over pretty much everyone. Remembering what his experience or experiences were, he did think that he changed from back then. Of course, not for the good. He actually looked awful back then, destroyed from the inside out. And even at the same time his pieces were reacting violently to his own aura, poisoning him to the point he could barely move, making every step a torture in itself. A chill crept up his spine when he remembered exactly what he felt at that time. Something he truly did not wish for anyone, not even for his worst enemy. Shaking his head he started to focus on his memory of that time, the talk with his partner. He needed to distract himself from the pain his body was experiencing. Remembering the explanation of Drake made the essay of that time widen his eyes, asking even more about it. He was really curious about it at that time, and for once in a long time, he felt happy. 
the dragon decided to explain it more easily and reached the conclusion of exemplifying what his words meant. So, he made himself as the example. He said that when he reached a certain age he awoke his aura, making him reach the heights of a heavenly dragon. And the so-called characteristic that he gained from his aura was, domination. A unique trait in the whole sense of the word. At that time it was also when he gained his first ability related to his aura of dominance. His own flames, capable of burning even gods to less than ash. The blazing inferno of scorching flames was his first ability, but just with this alone he managed to stand tall and proud against any other dragon. Well, until he met a certain white bastard. The brown-haired boy remembered the dragon's voice filled with sentimentalism, something rare in him now that he thought about it. When said white bastard was absolutely resistant to his flames, he felt excited yet scared, as someone just withstood his own flames. The two dragons started to fight against each other, not remembering exactly whether for pride or something else. Since each other were immune to their specialties, they derived other abilities with the help of their aura. He gained the ability to double his own strength and transferring it to other things. And the other dragon created the ability to divide others' strength and add it to his own, complete opposite abilities, all just to counter each other. Later on, in the middle of one of their fights, he managed to ask the white dragon about his trait, answering that his was, supremacy. He laughed at it, saying how arrogant that was even among their own kind, but he found this amusing. He then asked for the name of the dragon, Albion Gwyber was the answer he got. Finishing his explanation he stated that it was of utmost importance to figure out exactly what trait does his aura have. Something that up until this moment hadn't figured out. So aura, huh? Well, unexpected but not unwelcome. After all, I need something for me to become stronger. With a smile filled with viciousness, the boy said to no one in particular. He then turned his hand into a fist, and he stood up with slight difficulty. Looking down onto his body he stared right at the locations of his wounds, smiling at what was happening. They were being covered in this darkness, blocking the wounds from his view. The darkness gave the impression of a second skin and felt comfortable against his own flesh, like the cool sensation of freshly washed clothes. Then he sensed how his darkness healed the most obvious and painful wounds, closing them at a speed perceivable with the eye. Wounds like that even a single one of them would take a team of a dozen or so specialized supernatural doctors and over 20 hours of surgery just to patch up. A wound like that closing almost instantaneously, as if it was nothing but a scratch, was ridiculous. If someone could see it they would be shocked to the point they couldn't say anything. But this, one could see just how abnormal his aura actually was. This was one of the traits of his darkness, extreme regeneration and healing. Although, whether it could truly regenerate a lost limb or not wasn't known, either way, he didn't have the courage to test it. He shook his head to get rid of the dizziness and cracked his neck. Feeling the sweet pops of his cervical vertebrae. Well Drake, time to move on. Time waits for no one, let's make a trip to whatever place is fine, I just really need to clear my head. Nothing like a good old journey to expand my boundaries so that we can finally take our well-deserved break. The boy said as he looked down to his left palm, waiting for the dragon's response. However, he was only answered with silence. With an expression of concern and guilt in his eyes, he bit his own lip. He knew why the dragon hadn't answered him. He had explained it to him before he did this suicidal thing to get rid of the pieces that would have otherwise claimed his life. Sighing, he decided to walk towards the exit, or well, towards the only lit place inside this cavern. Walking toward the sweet light that made him feel butterflies in his stomach, he looked at his surroundings but, pling. A high-pitched sound echoed as his foot accidentally hit something on the stone floor. Turning his head and looking at his feet, he soon found something that made his entire expression change. He was pale, his eyes widened in pure shock. At his feet, a crimson pawn piece the size of a pinky was present. It had a really malicious aura surrounding it, and even some spots on the surface of the piece had turned black. Just by touching it he felt how his vitality was drained, and his whole body started to get exhausted. Bad memories came to his head thanks to that feeling. Gathering his courage he picked it up like it was something hideous to grab. He had a face filled with disgust and a weary look in his eyes. Well, if I want to start anew I need to move on from my past. Better put it back in a place where it can be found looking down at the piece with hesitancy decided. Turning back around he went to look for all the remaining pieces, hoping for the best. A few minutes later he stared at his own palms. Looking at eight crimson pawn pieces bathed in a little of his blood, tiny cracks all over their surface. Putting them in the blood-soaked pockets of his pants, he once again looked around the place of his revival. The cave filled with nothing but bloodied cracked walls, yet a single ray of light shone upon him from a hole in the roof. Before, this was a simple cave yet now, for him, it signified something completely else, a place he will never forget. Sighing, he made a slight smile at the corner of his lips. Taking his sweet time to remember the scenery in front of him. After a long minute, he turned around and walked away right towards the small light that was behind him. 
Walking in silence for a few minutes he finally reached the entrance of the cave. The light of the sun had momentarily blinded him, so he closed his eyes as a mere reflex. Moments later he slowly opened them, just like the ones of a newborn. He then looked at what was in front of him. A forest in who knows where. When he activated the transportation circle he didn't specify the location, he just wanted to get away from there as fast as he could. Straightening his back and looking resolutely at what was ahead, he walked into the forest. Right now he needed to do a few things before leaving on his journey, and putting the pieces back into his house was only the first step. Because he didn't want for someone to track him, well not that they would know that he was gone in the first place, he decided to do something back at home. He recalled the words he heard that night from a certain number of maidens. Those words were truly what had finally broke him. Even now, when he remembered them, it still hurt a lot. Even though he no longer had the emotions and feelings he had, bad memories were still bad, and that scene had tormented his mind till this very day however, he vowed that today was the last of those nightmares. Of those disgusting night terrors that made him scared of just sleeping. Shaking his head, he got rid of those memories. Well, let's start this shall we? This will certainly be interesting. I wonder what exactly will happen from now on. With a confident tone of voice that sounded sharp and cold he walked onwards, light shining from within his eyes. Soon they changed color, from their normal golden tone, they turned jet black with a red tinge at the center of the iris. At the same time a mark started to appear on his forehead, the same color as his own darkness. This being the demon mark, a simple side effect when using his aura, something simple that wasn't dangerous at all. The mark started at the left side of his forehead, in the shape of an spiral that circled itself two times ending upwards and towards the left, almost reaching the root of his hair. On the right side of the spiral, there were three spikes joined one amongst the other pointing upwards in a diagonally way. At the bottom part of the spiral, on the same side it ended upwards, a long yet thin spike reached all the way down, ending right above the eyebrow. At this moment he subconsciously released an aura that made the entire place within a 10 km radius tremble. Every living being in that radius started running away, and even the leaves on the trees started to move and rustle. Light itself started to fade little by little, and coldness replaced the warm feeling the forest had. The aura inside that place was suffocating. Even a high-class devil will find itself with the difficulty to breathe much less move. The aura was simply that menacing and heavy. Definitely something you wouldn't want to be aimed with. Walking onwards he reached the center of the forest, he then started to set up the transportation circle back to Kuo. He looked at his surroundings filled with beautiful tall trees and wet grass, with a few patches of moss here and there. While walking he remembered all the events in his life up until now, especially those after the war with Klepath and Trahixa. He remembered the final battle and how, after a conjoined effort of all the gods and beings with that level of strength, they barely managed to seal the beast in an especially modified dimension. After that, many deities went into hibernation, using all of their power truly made them weak. So many gods that before were actually active now were resting. Few deities actually still roamed the world, that included the devils, the angels, and the fallen angels. But his head occupied by his thoughts, he started to think about his future. He wanted to do something about it, but for now, things still needed to be done back at home. Luckily for him, they weren't that many. Soon after, the transportation circle was finished. Looking uncomfortably at the red and black magic circle, he gathered courage and moved. Standing at the center of it, he activated it. At the same moment he removed the effect that his darkness had on his body. His eyes turned back to yellow, and the mark on his forehead was also gone. He didn't want to become a beacon for other beings back at Kuo. He also didn't want them to start asking questions, so he decided to suppress his aura to that of a normal human. This way no one will suspect anything, an arduous task, but with good results nonetheless. Ah sighing, light started to gather at his surroundings. Seems like I will need time to get accustomed to my body. It still fells wobbly he awkwardly moved his arms. Drag also needs time to regain his consciousness. Well during this time period there are a few things that do not need special force, so better start with them. Light covered his field his vision. However, before he left, he muttered under his breath with a sharp and cold voice. A new Haidu Issei has been born. Now world, let's see what you got for me. With a depredatory smile he arrogantly said. Soon after he vanished from the forest, his next destination, Kuo his home. Inside a huge bedroom with a king-size bed, at the centermost part of the room, right against the wall, laid a brown-haired boy. The light that escaped in between his curtains disturbed his sleep, or like he liked to say, his nightmares. MMMM slowly awakening from his dreams he looked at both of his sides. This again, ha he said that to himself with a tired voice. He stood up from his bed, stretching his numb limbs. Now that I think about it. This room is far too big for a single person. Turning around and looking onto his bed, he found nothing. Yes, absolutely nothing. No one was here, something that at the beginning surprised him, but now, it no longer did. Making his bed in an orderly way, he decided to get into the shower. 
Right now he didn't want to train, he wasn't on the mood, again. Before going into the bath, he walked to the left of his bedroom and looked straight towards a dark colored wooden door. Gathering the courage he had left, he opened it. Creek, another room laid before him the sweet smell of a woman still fresh inside, yet no one could be seen. This room was no other than Rhea's Gremory's room. Big and filled with high-class furniture and a lot of expensive ornaments. An elegant chandelier hung from the ceiling, the walls were painted in an extravagant pinkish red, and there was even a huge carpet on the floor, with a Gremory sigil embedded onto it. Even the bed had its own curtain, he believed those types of beds were named canopy beds. It smelled sweet, like strawberries, and the bright sunlight illuminated the room, so everything inside could be perfectly seen. Yet the woman he loved was nowhere in sight, not a shadow of her figure was seen. Closing the door to the room, he sighed. Not here again, huh? How odd. With a tone filled with sarcasm he said to himself. Anger clearly present in those words. Entering his own bathroom, he went towards the shower. He slowly turned on the hot water while leaning forward, letting both hands rest on the wall. He was completely alone, but when one is left alone with his thoughts, one is going to wander around them. He remembered how much time passed since the campaign of the evil dragons, since the sealing of Trahixa and the death of Rizavim Live and Lufusur. Three months flew by, yet the damage done by him and the beast still wasn't the least bit repaired. Even a few extremist groups were formed to strike against the current government of the supernatural. Well, the good news were that the human world did not know about it, the majority of it anyway. Something that big it's just impossible to cover up. This information was mentioned by the former governor of the Fallen Angels, Azazel. But because of the incapacity of the so-called superiors, like the former governor said. All the upper echelons decided to just inform them yet ask them to not intervene. They had done far too much, and now it was their turn to do something. So the school life of all the Gremory and Citri groups started again. Now being in their last year before college. Now was the time to prepare and find a career. But for the brown-haired boy, this was the least of his concerns. Getting out of the shower and turning off the hot water, he went to the bathtub to relax. Sitting inside it, he let the warm water and the odor of some bath salts do their magic. His tense muscles seemed to relax a bit. But even with those things trying to relax him one could notice, just by looking at him, that he was in a pretty bad shape. Even the people that didn't know him much would be able to tell that something happened to him, something bad. His former buffed appearance was now mostly gone. His tanned healthy skin turned into a sickly pale white. His eyes lacked the luster the former him had, now resembling the ones of a corpse. Big eye bags adorned his face, big enough for one to notice the many sleepless nights. If one looked closely enough one would find, in different parts of his body, weird black spots. They were perfectly round and similar to gangrene, but they looked different. These spots were eight swirling pulsing black circles, and just by looking at them, one could imagine how painful they were. Amongst them, the worst of all were definitely the ones that is, being bigger, darker and much more ominous. Especially the one located at his heart, that one seemed much darker, deeper and eviler. Well, at least that's what Issei thought. Touching the one located just below his heart, he said. I don't understand what did I do to deserve this was it because I am a pervert. Or rather just like they said, was I just a nuisance. A dumb boy that is not worth anything. Talking to himself with a sad tone he stopped touching his heart, below the black spot. He remembered how he got these holes. This, corruption that destroyed his body the more he remembered them, lost in his thoughts, he remembered how they forgot about him. And at the moment he went to look for them what he saw. What an awful surprise. All the black spots pulsed, making him feel scorching pain, he recalled his worst memory. Dune flashback, two months flew by after the war. Now the students of the third year of Kuo Academy graduated and went to Kuo College Division. Among them, Rias Gremory, Himajima Akeno, Sona Sitri, and Tsubaki Shinra. Now the four great one Isamas were out of the school and inside college. In the beginning he was extremely happy for them, after all, how could one not be happy when your loved one graduated? The orc was still there, but it was different without Rias and Akeno, it was more work-centered. And the student council was so busy that the time they had to spend with everyone was almost nothing. Issei was now walking towards a huge edification covered with plants, flowers, moss and with a few parts of it falling down to the ground. For all, that building gave a really creepy vibe. The road he was walking on was broken, and some roots of the older trees were seen in an entangled mess all over the surface of it. He walked slowly, with his hands in his pockets and looking at the ground, thinking who knows what. But before he could continue with his thoughts, he was abruptly stopped by the voice of a good friend of his, a certain blonde knight. Hey, Issei Kun. A blonde-haired boy talked to him with his usual pretty boy smile, walking towards him. You okay? You seem distracted. The blonde commented. Nah, don't worry about it. Just thinking that we have been seeing ourselves less and less these days, since Rias and Akeno-san graduated. Taken by surprise by the comment of the brown-haired boy, the knight flinched. Yeah but he nodded his head. 
Now because of college we see each other less and less, and because of the club activities and the unusual amount of contracts we have to do, things do seem like that. With a sad smile he answered. Both of them talked as they walked closer to the Orc building. Soon they went past the big broken creepy wooden door used to enter the building, and towards the end of the left corridor. Only seeing a double wooden door at the end of their path. Opening the double door they saw a staircase in front. Soon after, they started walking up the stairs, grabbing the rusty railing that left a metal scent on their hands. Reaching the second floor they went to the second door to the right and opened it. Inside the big old looking room was the members of the orc. Looking further in, the brown haired boy saw two people he did not expect to see. Ria's a Kenosan, he thought. The room they were in was rather odd, the ceiling was really tall, and in all four walls bookcases filled his view. On these bookcases some strange sigils were written on their surfaces, all in a strange language he recognized as, devil letters. That touch gave a rather uncomfortable vibe to the whole room. At the far end, towards his left, one could see a black desk with a black leather chair. Four couches red in color were accommodated at the center of the room, now filled with people. Seeing the two women sitting on one of the couches he was faster than the night for once. Even speaking with a cheerful voice. Rias. Akeno-san. The two women hurriedly turned and looked at the boy. Yet something in their eyes scared him, he did not know what, but something seemed different from the way they used to look at him, well, hello eyes. With a neutral and even emotionless tone of voice, the red-haired woman talked to him. Issei was taken by surprise by her tone, being more direct and even a bit cold. Ice Kun it's nice to see you again. It has been a while. Yet the answer of the Yamato Natashiko froze him up. Nothing seemingly wrong with her words, yet he could detect she was different, at least towards him. In the past she would have run towards him and hugged him, but now she did nothing. Even the smile she had was forced as if she talked to someone that she didn't care for. The blonde knight on his left also detected something odd, but quickly compassed himself. Taking a look towards his friend he saw him standing there, not moving not even blinking. Quickly acting up before something happened, he spoke. Ria's sama How have you been? It's been more than a month since we last saw you. The knight calmly asked in a too professional tone. But Ria's didn't perceive the tone used by said knight. Yes, Yudo. College has kept us quite busy, so I apologize for that. But since today we had a free day we decided to come by and check how things are going. Right Akeno. She answered. Meanwhile, Issei came back to himself and was about to speak up, but was stopped by the answer of Akeno. Yes. We had free time and wanted to check on all of you, especially on Asia since she is the new president. But by the looks of it, she has been doing well. Yes, Akeno Wanisama, Ria's Wanisama. All of us have been quite well, thanks for asking. The blonde-haired woman answered in a cheerful voice while smiling. Kiba and Issei realized how she didn't notice how they were acting towards Issei. Actually, for Kiba, it seemed as if she decided to ignore what happened, something that was weird coming from her. Taking the word, Kaneko spoke. Ria-sama, Akeno-senpai, we've been well. Even my sister has been well thanks to Yasaka-sama, talking to her about a possible job. Being an ambassador of the Imkai. Completely changing the subject of the talk, Kaneko talked about her sister. The blonde-haired boy became suspicious, it seemed as if something happened to all women lives, and were trying to hide it from the male. Even Zenobia and Irina, that would normally talk among themselves were quiet. Odd, quite odd, oh. So something like that happened to Kuroka-sama, I'm happy for her. Smoothly replying, Ravel talked from the couch at the left of Kaneko. A certain brown-haired boy walked closer to them, his bangs covering his eyes, obscuring them. Is that all you are for to check with a cold tone, he almost screamed. Then he widened his eyes, he realized that his words were cold, so he hurriedly began talking with a soft and warm voice. Would you not want to talk more? Tell us about your college life. Anything at all. We have time, after all, it's Friday. Tomorrow there is no school for both of us, so why not we take this time to catch up? Knowing about his mistake of talking like that, he asked with a goofy smile on his face. Fibber released a sigh of relief, but what came next surprised him as much as it was possible. With a clearly strict and cold tone, Rhea spoke. Yes, we only came for that ice. Her voice sharpened. We are very busy and later today we have a meeting with our class to check on some projects we need to do. We also came to tell all of you a couple of things. Dismissing the comment of ice, the red-haired stated. The Keno then spoke up. We came only to say that in the near future we won't be able to spend much time among ourselves. After all, right now college is quite tough, and being the future president and vice president of our faculty only makes it tougher. So our senpai has been kind enough to guide us, so that we can take up their positions well enough. The Keno spoke up towards no one in particular, but Issei knew it was towards him. Even the mention of that senpai was slightly different from the rest of her words, being flirty and ill. Call it a gut feeling of Issei. Udo. Ria's turned around and looked straight at her knight. 
we also came to tell you that because of recent events our contracts have been increasing, but because there are only so much we can do, and since Issa is the worst of the worst at it, I need you to take a few more contracts in his place. Hiba was with a face filled with shock. Don't worry there won't be that many, so that it affects you studies, be at ease. Ria said as he looked at him. Hiba, on the other hand, didn't expect of her to just insult Issa like that. Those words were something he never thought that would come out of her. Completely out of breath at the sudden insult towards his best friend, he did not have the words to answer back. I'll take your silence as an answer. Now, excuse us, but we need to leave. The two of them stood up and walked towards the exit, passing by Issei and not even looking at him. One could see the boy tremble in disbelief, but he just stood there, not saying anything. A couple of minutes passed and the only ones left were Kiba and Issei. The former worried about the later and surprised about how things turned out. He was even more shocked about how the rest of the girls did nothing, not even looking at him. Like they didn't know him, as if he wasn't worth anything in their eyes. Waiting for Issei to come back to himself, he thought about the new order his master gave him. Annoying it was, it seemed that he will need to make adjustments to his schedule. Training will be completely left out, at least for now, until he completes the new contracts he will get instead of Issei. Issei woke up from his stupor. Seeing no one except Kiba in the room, he tightly wrapped his left hand into a fist. Drip drip, blood came from his hand, slowly painting the wooden floor with a few red drops. Really only that two months without seeing each other and that's what you say with a tone filled with sadness, melancholy, anger, and fury, the brown-haired spat. What happened? Why has everyone around me changed so goddamn much? He screamed from in between his teeth. Also getting a heeache at the mention of the Holy One. Smash, he punched the wall and made a hole on it. It wasn't that deep, but it still proved how angry he actually was. Tiba could see how his friend was suffering, it did not surprise him. After all, two whole months without speaking to any of them, as if they were someone else. And when he did try to go talk to any of them they would answer with an I'm busy, don't bother me now, get out pervert. Sorry, but maybe next time, so he wasn't surprised by his sudden explosion. One could guess just how bad his mental state was. He was quieter and less open than before, proof that this did serious damage to him, and even his physical appearance seemed different. But what could he do? He tried talking with him, but Issei just avoided the topic completely. Only by sparring did Issei get all those thoughts out of his head, and now, there won't be time even for that. Diba felt useless, truly useless. What a friend he was Kiba knew that speaking with someone else won't cut it, and the rest of the group were always doing other things. Asper was in the hospital with Valerie, waiting for her recovery. Azizel Sensei was always in Grigori because of recent past events. The girls well you can answer that one. The student council was far too busy with the school and with the project of their king. Serzicha Sama, Grafia Sama, Michael San, Bali, were all busy. Either with political treaties, damage repair, fixing their own territory, or with missions to help the cause against those rebelling groups. Raswa Sensei was called back by the Norse Pantheon because of something Aden Sama asked her to help with. They heard from her that it was related to the barrier trapping the Trahiksa, and that she didn't even know when would she come back. She only left after saying goodbye to Issei, and after that contact was lost, no one could reach her. He assumed that because the work was far too important to let distractions in, no contact was allowed. So in the end there was no one, nothing could be done. Issei turned around as fast as he could, kicking the door open and saying to himself, I need to go where they are. I need answers from them, and that little speech won't cut it. As a soul that ran out of hell, Issei was gone, leaving Kib alone in the room. Twenty minutes later, Issei ran as fast as he could. His destination, Kuo College Division. However, he heard a voice inside of his head. Partner. What happened? Why are you running? Are you being chased by the girls of your school? Again Drake talked to him mentally, tiredness present in his voice. Issei stopped running and looked at his left hand, more specifically the reverse of his palm. The green circle shining in a dull green light was right on the reverse of his palm. Drake. He was happy. Partner is good to hear you, I did not hear of you in the entire day. But the conversation needs to be postponed, right now, I have something I need to do. Surprised by the severity in the tone of voice of his partner, Drake understood. Something must be, or will go wrong. Okay partner. He agreed with him. But I will stay awake for now to see what exactly happened. Whatever you need, just talk, I'll be there. Drake solemnly answered. Thanks Paul. I'll explain things to you as soon as I am done. Continuing his run, Issei decided to take a shortcut through the park. Maybe that way he can catch up to them. Running like he just stole something, he swiftly went through the park, and after a couple of minutes of running, he finally saw the orc a few meters up ahead. He watched how the girls said their goodbyes to Rias and Akeno, something he found odd. When did they start to accompany them? Why did they do it? Simple courtesy or something else. Maybe they have something to do here. Shaking his head he left those thoughts for another time. 
Issei then followed Riaz and Akeno inside their college. Greg was quiet, but he was thinking the same as his partner. Being a millennia-old dragon he knew something was off. Experience is the greatest teacher, and right now he felt something bad will happen to his partner, something really bad. Before Issei, a big metal gate made its appearance as the entrance door, having a rather rusty and broken look to it. Walls of bricks were at either side of the gate all covered in moss, symbolizing that they were old. Looking beyond the gate one could see a big building in the furthermost part of the complex, and alongside it, many smaller buildings which could be the other fraternities of the college were present. However, not a single student was outside, and thanks to that getting in was quite easy, no problem at all. Walking past the gate, he looked at the backs of the two women he was looking for, but instead of running as fast as he could towards them, he decided to follow them. Something about them felt weird. Continuing his chase the two women expertly crossed the campus. Said campus being a full patch of dirt and grass with a few statues of what he guessed to be the founder of the college and other important teachers. A lot of trees adorned the path he was walking on, he could identify some as rosewood trees, thanks to their purplish flowers. Many other trees were alongside them, but he was no expert, so he couldn't decipher what species of trees they were. The smell was of freshly cut grass and wet dirt, something he expected about such a big campus. The buildings were styled like the ones in old British movies. They were similar to images he had seen of Oxford when he was looking for universities in his free time. Maybe the founder got inspired by the British architecture. Who knows. Being late, around 5 pm on a Friday, the students were gone. Just a minority were left for whatever reason they must have. Walking towards the building he saw at the entrance, the pair of women continued their walk while talking among themselves. It appeared they did not notice someone was following them, a lack of awareness on their part. Soon, they finally entered the main building that seemed to be their faculty. They crossed the main door of the faculty and walked towards a huge staircase that covered almost all the room they were in. At both sides of the floor above them, balconies adorned the halls making it seem refined and high class. Reaching the end of the stairs they made a last left turn, and at the very bottom of the hallway, one could see a double door with a sign above it. It read as student faculty in bright gold letters and encased in a wooden framework with intricate details. Clearly, someone spent some money on it. Issei, still being at the end stairs, peeked his head out and saw how Rias knocked on the door. Seconds later, a man made his appearance. He was tall, around six foot something, appearing to be in his early twenties. His physique was quite big, so he did some kind of sport, Issei's fighting experience kicking in made him guess martial arts. He had shoulder-length blonde hair and blue eyes as clear as the sky, but something within them made Issei uncomfortable. Not that he was strong, but more like he was a threat to him. Reaching that conclusion he continued watching the man as he talked to Riaz and Akeno. Soon after some talk, the man invited them in. Partner something is not right. Something is just odd Drake finally talked with hidden worry in his voice. Partner, I feel something terrible will happen to you. You should leave. Surprised at the sudden words of his partner, he widened his eyes and mentally answered. Greg. What are you talking about? Nothing will happen. Although looking like that, that guy is weak, pitifully so. Maybe around low class devil, if not lower. Issei answered in his mind, but he had to agree he did feel threaded, but for a completely different reason he did not yet understood. I know partner. His tone exasperated. But something about that guy makes me feel uneasy. It's as if he will leave you so terribly wounded you might no be able to do anything else in your life. His words were serious. Just hear me out and let's go away. You can ask them at another time, or maybe even the other girls. Drake stated, worry present in his voice, but his partner was just too stubborn. The FFT. Come on Drake. He told the dragon. Just a quick peek inside. I will hear what they want to talk about and after that, we leave. Then I'll wait for them at the entrance of the school. The boy stubbornly answered, but deeply inside he had fear. Quick, before the door closes. Wait. Partner don't cutting the communication with the dragon. Even cutting him mid-speech, he sprinted towards the door. Promoting to night he ran towards the door just before it closed. Sticking his finger in before it closed, he made a gap big enough for him to see without someone inside noticing him. Quickly thanking his extremely good eyesight, he looked inside. An extremely luxurious room stood before him. Pine leather couches laid on its center. One big enough to fit three people and still have room to spare. On each side of the biggest couch, there were two smaller ones, fitting for a single person. In front of it, a normal dark wooden table with three teacups filled with recently poured tea. Further in, right against the wall, there were bookcases. The sheer number of books was enough to fill the entire wall. And in front of them, there was a big leather chair with an accompanying desk the same tone as the wooden table. The ceiling had a fancy chandelier, while tall lamps with ornaments adorned the corners of the room. But it wasn't the room that took the air out of his lungs, it wasn't the furniture, no. It was the ones inside said room. That image took the entire life out of him. Sitting on the biggest couch in the room were the two women he was looking for. 
But both of them were leaning their entire weight upon the man he saw before, with a blush on his s and a stupid smile on his face. Both women were wrapping themselves around him like a snake about to eat their prey. Their eyes were filled with happiness and enjoyment. The kind of happiness he had seen when he made Akino reconcile with her father and when he declared his love to Rias in the orc. The dragon inside the boosted gear went wide-eyed at the scene, hoping his eyes went bad due to old age. He even went to the extremes of asking the dead god of the bible for his eyesight to be wrong. Quickly checking how his partner was, he managed to figure out something on him. Disbelief appeared in his eyes. He could not find anything. Not even the slightest fragment of emotion could be seen nor felt. It's as if his brain and body just shut down, placing his entire attention to the scene in front of his eyes. He also could not enter the mind realm of his partner, but guessing by the information obtained so far, the situation was not good. Wishing to check again, he tried once more, but nothing happened. He repeated the process over and over again, but only finding the same to happen. Leaving that aside he decided to monitor his partner's body. A chill ran up his spine when he noticed how his body currently was. Just how could that happen? Drake quickly screamed, but it seemed to say was not capable of hearing him. Those things gave him his power. Damn. They even gave him back his life in the beginning. How could such a vicious reaction occur in his body? Drake quickly said to himself, surprised and even a little bit scared by the horrendous reaction happening inside his partner's body. It's because of them. How could something like this happen because of those women? Anger filled the Red Dragon Emperor. His voice full of venom as he spat his conclusion. He was furious. Those disgusting women were actually doing something that horrible to his partner. Partner? Lee but before he could tell his partner to stop watching and to leave this place immediately, a voice interrupted his thoughts. Said voice was of the man sitting on the couch. Right in between the pair of women. Scene change inside the room. Rias, Akeno. I mean, I know you both like me, but please, not here. We need to check some papers as well as passing them to our professors. The man talked as he blushed. We can do this tomorrow. After all, I promised to go on a date with both of you. The man said towards the two women at both sides of him, pride filled his voice, and a smile filled adorn his face. How could he not be like that? Two of the most beautiful women he ever laid eyes upon were fighting for him. Answering his question, Akeno spoke up in a flirty voice. MMMM Akeno hummed seductively. What are you talking about Riaiji? You want this as much as we wanted. So, let's, take, A B R E A A K Akeno muttered the last words with a sensual voice that made the now named Riaiji blush even more. Gathering courage Riaiji decided to go for it. But before something could happen, an angry voice was heard right behind him. He listened to the furious voice of the other woman by his side. Akeno. What do you think you're doing, trying to seduce him in front of me? Angrily, Ria stepped in before he could try something. Feeling scared of her he did not do a thing, he just sat there, not moving a muscle. Then she said with a voice filled with duality. I will show you who is the best among us, R-E-I-J-I-I-I-I. The woman started to move. She was slowly showing her well-endowed curves, making Riaiji swallow his spit. But before he managed to achieve her goal a voice was heard, said voice being a keno. Arara, Riaz. Trying to get on him without me. Sorry, but I will not let you. Throwing herself at him, she stopped the advances of the red-haired. He fell onto the couch, a keno on top of him in a really easy to misunderstand position. Riaz, so to not fall onto the ground, quickly stood up. On seeing the image in front of her she was filled with anger and fury. A keno. If you do not stop now I will have to get him off you by force. You know I love him. So why do you always want the same thing as I do? With a nice smile on her face Ria screamed, anger clearly visible in her eyes. Her emotion slowly changed her eyes into a red color. Riaiji felt a chill run up his spine and started to sweat bullets, but Akeno didn't even hesitate. Ra Ra what do you mean by saying that I want him just because you love him? He was the first guy I met which didn't have a disgusting look in his eyes. He did not look at me like a piece of meat, really kind as well. Just look at him he is M-A-N-L-Y-Y, good L-O-O-K-I-N-G, and doesn't look at me like a piece of trash would do. How could I not fall for him? But the serious tone of voice the black-haired woman spoke up. Not knowing how impactful her words were in the good sense and the bad sense. Riaz felt her blood boil at those words, but she knew she was right, that was also one of the many reasons why she fell in love with Riaiji. Calming herself down she looked at them clear-headed. Something that surprised the both in front of her. Ah she let out a long breath of air, trying to calm herself down before she did something stupid. Once relaxed she looked at both of them, especially at Akeno, and said with a resolute voice. But for our brown-haired boy it sounded sharp, merciless, and dug straight into his heart. Through the fact that he isn't a pervert or drools over it merely our side is truly a blessing. Her voice calm and sharp. Much better than any man I had ever met, that's for sure. She asserted. It's also true that he is manly, decisive, and kind. 
these are also few of the reasons I love him. But first and foremost, is the fact that he is not dumb, naive, pervert like someone Akeno and I know. Akeno further brows at the remembrance of that man. Certainly compared to anyone else, especially to him truly is above in all aspects. Especially in the looks department. Akeno's voice was flirty at the end. I have to concur that him not being a dumb pervert or a maniac obsessed with S is the greatest blessing we could have. Finishing the comment of Ria's, Akeno spoke with a cold voice. Unknowingly how much damage had her words done to someone. Also, it's nice for him to understand our intentions and not to explain them with a big sign over our heads. I'm glad you figured them out, Ryaiji truly something I want in the future for the man, ILOVEE Ria's told him. Well let's keep going. I need if you want me to do the work. It's quite late and the work needs to be done so, M-E-R-E-I-J-I-I-I -I 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 putting her lips forward she begged for the dot. Answering her, he stood up from the couch and walked towards the red-haired beauty. Leaving a pouty Akeno on the couch, quickly stealing her lips, he had Ria's. The sound of lips connecting was the only thing that could be heard. But that scene was something that was burned into the mind of our spectator. That scene of Ria's ing that man made the brown-haired boy empty. He truly didn't understand, why? Was it because of the words both of them had said about him? Was it truly because he was a fool, a pervert, naive and dumb? His thought stopped when he looked back to the scene of the dot but this time with eyes devoid of any light, like those of a corpse. It quickly became more intoxicating. Tongues started to fight a battle for dominance. After a while, the woman broke that she was in need of air. But she felt that compared to someone he wasn't that good of error. Getting rid of the thought, she quickly looked over to him. Only to be taken by surprise when Akeno jumped towards him and at him even more fervently. She was more daring that Ria's, of that he was sure. Quickly breaking the, Akeno said. H-U-H-U-H-U -u 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 really quite the charmer, aren't you Riaiji? To make Ria's ask for is quite impressive. But I will show you who, is the bester among us T-W-O she leaned forward, she was searching for his lips. She had him for the third time, but she felt something was missing from the, however, the became more passionate, being a sadist she took control of the battlefield really fast. But she decided to break it before the red-haired got jealous and tried something. That will make her feel even more competitive. Riaiji felt extremely good. He just had two beauties. Two of the most beautiful women he had ever seen in his life. He turned towards the clock sitting at his desk, 5.30 p.m. The time they spent talking and ing was too much. Now they only had 30 minutes before their deadline. Sprinting towards his desk he decided to start working as fast as he could. Noticing that, Akeno and Riaz also looked at the clock and quickly started to fill papers in. Thinking of a certain boy, but erasing the thought. They concentrated on the task before the deadline arrives. Scene change outside the student faculty. Staying outside the room Issei was on his knees, recapitulating the words said inside that room. He felt empty, completely empty. Just remembering those words made him sad, angered, and completely broken overall. The scene of the between Riaiji and Ria's was like a sharp knife, twisting and turning inside his heart. He felt his body go weak, his vision was clouded with unsheathed tears, his sense of balance gone. Standing up with whatever strength he had left. He walked away from that place. Walking down the stairs, grabbing the metal railing. He walked slowly, painfully slowly until he reached the last step of the staircase. Reaching the bottom of the staircase. He looked back up, tears threatened to come out of his eyes, but they didn't. Soon, he lost control of his body and fell down to his knees, he felt dizzy and started to hyperventilate. Pant. 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 Sweat formed throughout his body. His head spinning and his body trembling, as if he had spasms. That scene, those words, just wouldn't go away. They kept repeating inside his head, over and over again. But suddenly he heard a voice inside his head. Dot dot er, tner. Partner. The dragon roared inside his head. Getting him out of those thoughts. Grateful towards the dragon he wanted to talk to him, but words did not leave his mouth. He heard Drake's voice again. Partner, answer me. Shit, Issei answer me. Show me that you can listen to me. Move your left hand up. Slowly, Issei moved his hand up. That made the dragon happy, his partner finally heard him. Partner, hear me out. Get away from here as fast as possible. Your body is not right. The dragon was anxious. The evil pieces are acting strangely, I can no longer control them. Your power as a dragon is also reacting violently towards the energy released from the pawn pieces. We need to leave, quickly find somewhere peaceful and quiet. Understanding that the words of his partner were right, Issei slowly stood up. Suddenly losing his balance, he went towards the wall to have some sort of support. His head became clear after what he felt as an eternity. Shit. My body does not respond to me. I'm feeling extremely hot and sweaty, even my hurts a lot. What exactly happened? Getting him out of his thoughts Drag answered his question. Partner it's the evil pieces. They are acting strange. You can no longer control them, and they are releasing a terrible aura that is clashing with your dragonic power. 
The heat and the pain are proof of that. We need to leave, quickly. Using magic or even the boosted gear in this state will probably kill you. So start moving. Commented the dragon with a serious voice. Issei made haste and started to move his body. With every step he felt as if his muscles were ripped apart, as if his tendons were torn, and as if his bones were twisted. He felt every single part of his body burn, as if he was just thrown into the burning pits of hell. Each step was a challenge, the heat he felt became more annoying. Sweat started to accumulate, dropping visibly down his towards the chin and down to the ground, but he moved. He had only one goal, and that was to get out of here as soon as possible. Making the greatest effort he ever made in his entire life, he reached the door of the building. He pushed it open while the hinges of the door made a loud noise. Soon, after pushing the entire door open, he saw a beautiful scenery. The green grass was now painted with an orange tinge because of the sunset, and the statues were shining brightly because of the sunlight. The smell of freshly cut grass was still there, but now it had a tinge of rosewood that was thanks to the trees that were rooted in some places of the campus. He could hear the wind howling and the leaves rustling. A beautiful sight indeed if he did not feel like shit. Walking away from the building, towards the center of the campus passing by the statues and the other faculties, he heard Drake's voice filled with encouragement. Come on partner. You can do it. After the gate there is the park you ran through when you first came. Let's go there. Your house is too far away to even try to go at it in your current state. Once in the park, I'll tell you about your body. Well, as far as I know. Walking past the metal gate, he saw the park. It stood like the most beautiful painting he had ever seen. The dirt road was clearly marked on the ground, and further in, it separated into many different paths, going to different places. Many trees stood proudly at what he thought to be the gate. Because there was nothing, aside from the brick walls surrounding the man-made park, he thought those huge trees pointed at the entrance of the park. Walls taller than most cars surrounded the park, showing that the entire block was a part of it. Walking as fast as he could he went inwards, trying to find a bench to rest his body. Walking by different plants, flowers, trees and even a few animals he saw here and there, he chose the right path of the dirt road that signaled him to go further in. Not knowing what was expecting him, he moved his tired body until he saw a big fountain. After what he felt like an eternity, he saw his savior. Like the most beautiful women he had ever seen, like when he first obtained the balance breaker, like when he defeated Apophis, the bench was firmly planted on the ground near that fountain, waiting for him to sit on it to finally rest. Reaching the bench he noticed a bush behind it, it was big enough to cover the body of an entire person. Taking a look bang it, to check if something was behind it, he sat on the bench just some mindless paranoia. AI releasing a very heavy sigh he laid down on the bench, wiping the sweat off his face with his shirt. Trying to gain his breath back he noticed that the pain he felt earlier was now subsiding. Something he was extremely grateful for. Turning his eyes to the fountain in front, he saw the beauty of the park. Birds were chirping and flying in the sky, landing on the branches of the multiple trees that were rooted on the ground. With the help of the wind, the trees and its leaves were moving peacefully from one way to the other, and nothing except the sound of leaves falling to the ground, as well as the sound of the animals, was heard. Not a single human voice or car engine was heard. Really a peaceful moment in all this chaos he just experienced. Finally, after his moment of courage, he started to break down. Tears fell down his face. Blood was coming off of his hands because of his nails digging in his skin. He felt the flavor of iron in his mouth, and soon he started to cough. Cough, he even spitted a mouthful of blood. Why, why, just what did I do? Why do I deserve this? He started to mentally break down. Was it because I'm a pervert? A fool and naive being? Was it because I was kind to others? All right, stop right there. The dragon quickly made its appearance. Do not think like that. I do not know why they did it, but I know it wasn't because you were kind. So don't think like that. Drake told him. He hated how his possessor and friend ended up like this. He wanted to help him, but he couldn't do much just support him. Greg why you say that you also heard them? You also saw them? So please tell me why, he wanted answers. Why, are they doing that with it that that er? Furious, Issei asked Drake. I do now know why they did what they did. But I do know that it wasn't because you were kind. He explained. Sure, you were dumb and a pervert, but that can be fixed. No one was born knowing everything, no one was born perfect. He told his partner with a serious tone. About you pervertedness, you can control and dominate it. If you are not manly, then buff up. If you're not handsome, then change your style until you find yourself good looking. His voice was filled with pride, the pride of a dragon. Everyone has an opinion. To some people you may be like that, but to others, the ones that truly care for you, you're completely different. Don't let their words reach you. Prove them wrong with your actions, show them what you truly are. A dragon. He roared those last words. The motivational words spoken from Drake truly did reach him, his crying stopped. Swallowing the blood in his mouth, he looked up to the dark sky. 
Seeing the cloud slowly move further and further away, he sat there on his bench for a while until the sun set down. The moon rose up, changing the color of the sky to a slightly darker blue. After all this time spent thinking, he found out that the words of Drake were right. Even if they went with other people, to another man, he still had others. Girls that truly loved him. Even though it hurt him far too much to accept it. After all, if you give up on life, then life will give up on you. You will only sink further and further inside the mud. Thanks Drake. I really needed that. He told his friend. You're right, even if they think like that. So what? I still have others that do not think like them. It's impossible for everyone around me to think as they do. He finally regained his confidence. The dragon could hear his voice, now it sounded better. But before saying anything, he felt some strong auras near them. Quickly partner, hide. I feel multiple strong presences coming towards this place. In your actual state you are no match for any of them. I'll help you in hiding your aura. Now that you are in this weak state, it will be much more easier hiding you from others, even if they are stronger than you. Flinching at the comment of the dragon, he hid behind his bench in the bush he earlier inspected. Slowly but surely, he heard voices. It was kind of late, around 8 pm, so finding someone at this time in the park was rather odd. Hearing the voices closing in, he recognized them, but the topic of their conversation was something that made him vomit blood behind the bush. Larg, thankfully they didn't hear him. Hey Asia what do you think of these, quite beautiful right? The boy I like gifted them to me. Beautiful aren't they? That voice was of Irina Shudu, the childhood friend of Issei. She was happily jumping around with over 100 roses on her hands, carefully ordered in a couple of bouquets. Answering instead of Asia, Zenobia talked. Huh? Why do you feel so prideful? Isn't that a sin? You'll fall you know Arena. Besides, he gifted them to you so that you could agree into becoming his girlfriend. Zenobia quickly countered Arena. True but Ryudro is so sweet, nice, and gentlemanly. Besides, he always spends time with me, I love him. Her voice sounded sweet and dreamy. The blush was on her s. She was bringing both hands towards her face, trying to cover her blush. Looking at her, Asia said. Arena san, Zenobia san. It's true that the gifts were beautiful, but still I do not think you should keep saying it. Both of you have boyfriends and I believe that if Ryudro san and Saoji san were to hear you they will start fighting. Shyly talking, Asia gave her own advice. Ah. Both of them screamed at the same time. They realized that her words were true. Even though they are brothers, they are extremely competitive towards each other. Last time they barely stopped them. Changing the subject of the talk, Zenobia quickly teased Asia. Oh. So Asia, what about Ken? You two have been quite lovey dovey recently. Doesn't he help you with the club work? Also, there is a rumor that says that the two of you were holding hands and evening. So is it true? Skillfully, Zenobia asked Asia. Getting the constant nods of an excited arena. Eh, uh, well just she was made a mess thanks to that comment. Yes those rumors are actually true. Asia answered with honesty despite a red face. Suddenly the fourth figure accompanying them spoke up, Asia Senpai Daring. She was short white haired girl, she was eating her candy, and her voice was almost without a trace of emotion. In response Asia went even redder and hid behind Zenobia. Drew Kaneko-chan, but don't you also have someone? If my memory isn't wrong someone of the same year but from a different class. I believe his name was Hijama. Taken by surprise by Zenobia's sudden remark, Kaneko widened her little eyes. H how do you can know about T that? Stuttering in her response, Kaneko blushed. So the rumor was true. You did like the youngest brother of Saoji and Ryudro. Irina stated with a face full of surprise. So is the other rumor that Ravel is also after him true? She asked Kaneko again. One could see how her face changed from the previous blushing, it became emotionless and sharp even her eyes became slightly cold. HMPH. That fried chicken is unfortunately also after him. But she will never win. After all, I am at an advantage, sooner or later he will confess to me. I have the feeling it would be at the ending of the month. Kaneko replied with a full sentence filled with a lot of words. Something not normal about her, showing proof that she truly liked the Tijama. While continuing their walk, Irina made a question that made the hidden brown-haired boy react. Suo. What do you like about him Kaneko-chan? She answered at a speed faster than a knight's. He is no pervert. I hate perverts. Especially perverted senpai. He's the worst of the worst, real scum. Wah. Quite the rude words towards Ice Kun there. But I have to agree. I hate how he's always thinking about doing something perverted. Gives me the creep she had a face filled with slight disgust. Don't be that cruel towards Ice. Those words made Issei smile slightly. At least, someone cared about him and didn't spit behind his back. However, that smile turned into a scowl. Although he is really perverted and we all hate that about him. He's still kind. So you could say it somehow counters it. Zenobia said, but the stares from Arena and Kaneko and even the slight glare of Asia made her retract her words. 
okay. Don't look at me with those eyes. She raised both arms up. I mean sure, he really is dumb and foolish to the extreme, even for me to say. Let's not mention perverted and even lustful. But his kindness was always a good trait. Even though he has much more bad ones, than good ones. Zenobia said, but Kaneko replied with a tone filed with sarcasm and scorn, one good, everything else bad. That caused Asia and Arena to giggle and Zenobia to say. Well that's true. She said without any remorse in her face. Well, now that we have someone that's not bad to us, you could say that all those bad memories will be gone. The blue-haired said to them. Causing the rest of the girls to nod and loudly say. Drew, much better than before. That comment, Larg. Cause Issa to vomit another mouthful of blood. They soon walked away from the park, their silhouettes moving away from his location. Issa was still hiding behind the bush. He couldn't move, even breathing was a hassle. The pain he felt before now came twice even three times as bad. It caused his body to convulse. The spots he felt before in his were now burning hot. Other places around his body were feeling the exact same. Blood started to come out his mouth, choking him. He could barely hear the voice of his partner, his head filled with something else entirely. So it was true everyone told lies to me, his thoughts were reaching a terrible state. The way they acted towards me. He screamed inside his head, making a purple light to start surrounding his body. Those smiles given to me. The light increased in density and made his eyes change from yellow to pitch black. All that so-called love all of it was a lie. He screamed with all of his force, making the light cover his body, as if protecting him. They always hated me. All those moments were nothing but lies, 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 lies. He screamed expelling the light from his body, covering his surroundings with only purple and black particles. Afterward, a weird miasma started to come out of his body. It was like a fog that covered the ground, not showing the green grass beneath him. It was black in color with little hints of red, a violet light was shining at random intervals. The feelings he now experienced were nothing but sadness, frustration, pain, agony, rage, grief, shame, and so many more. Repeating his monologue over and over again, inside his mind. The scene of Rias and Akeno with that er. The words from Zenovia, Irina, Asia, and Kaneko. The truth about why were they never, not even for a moment with him in the past two months, slowly unraveled itself before his eyes. They were with someone else. Every single one of them. They lied and used him just during the moments when they would surely die. Just when they needed something. Just when they needed a shield. Just for their own personal gain. The miasma surrounding him was taking the form of a second skin, giving him a really frightening look. The weird mark appeared on the left side of his forehead. And at that moment, he felt his body being filled with power. The pain he felt before was still there, but not as strong as before. He felt how the entire world started to change. A door opened before him, in the worst moment of his life, yet he didn't even know about it. The horrible emotions he felt started to corrupt his mind. He suddenly lost control of himself, and the miasma that was gathering in the form of a second skin broke loose. Scene change Cool Town. Everyone inside Cool Town started to feel odd. Some started to feel goosebumps all over their skin. Others couldn't breath properly, barely having the strength to hold their own breath. Others started to sweat profusely and felt cold and chills all over their body. Their survival instincts were telling them to run, the further the better. However, a huge pressure fell upon everyone, paralyzing them on the spot. Their faces lost all color, and they all could feel as if a disaster was about to happen. Some of them got lucky and just fainted after some time, but others had to deal with this. However, everyone inside the city whether supernatural or not, started to experience those symptoms. As if something terrible just happened. As if the balance and peace of the world was just broken. As if a chained monster just broke his bindings. The clear and beautiful night sky turned pitch black, not even the moon could be seen. Fog started to appear around the city, giving it a spectral look. Coldness erupted everywhere and a menacing vibe surrounded every living soul. They could feel their hearts being gripped by an invisible hand, ready to crush them with a single movement. At the same time, the same sensation was experienced by all of the ones inside Kuo's college division. How could that be possible? It's halfway through summer, even if it's nighttime this is ridiculous. Ryaiji said, letting out his breath in between his hands. One could still see the frozen breath in the air slowly dissipating. He knew that this climate change was not normal. Looking towards Akeno and Ria's he saw them surprised and frightened, for whatever reason it may be. However, they didn't move so he became worried. Walking towards them, he felt how in the place they were standing the atmosphere felt many, many times worse. As if all of this was directed towards them. Their lips were pale, almost blue. Their faces drained of all color and they were barely hanging on to their consciousness. They were shaking, their teeth also chattered noisily. Sweat started to flow down their foreheads, just like a terrible fever. They were petrified, not daring to move an inch. 
he tried to move closer, but when he reached just 10 feet away from them he fell to his knees, trembling all over and, huff huff. Breathing heavily. Whatever was the cause of this ridiculous climatic change, it didn't want him to get near them. In other places around Kuo the rest of the girls' arena, Asia, Zenobia, Ravel, and Kaneko, felt the exact same way as Ria's and Akeno. Their bodies completely frozen, as if trapped in ice. But just as the feeling came from nowhere it was also gone they were freed from that feeling of terror. Like it was a bad joke from the heavens, as if it didn't even exist. But they knew it was real. However, no one else felt what they did, the symptoms they felt compared to the rest, were vastly different and in fear of making whatever it was that did this, angry, they did not dare report it to the higher-ups. The sky cleared up, the moon could be seen amongst the many clouds in the sky, but the mist was still there. The coldness disappeared, and instead, the climate of a normal chilly summer night appeared. The sole difference was that it was much darker than before, just like midnight. They did not know what had happened, it was too mysterious. Thankfully no one got hurt, they were the worst ones of the bunch, but after a couple of minutes they returned back to normal. But that sensation, that feeling of impending death was something they will never forget. Scene change park, trying not to scream his lungs out, in the middle of the park, laid a boy on his knees. The miasma that he was expulsing caused the air around him to cool and the ground to crack. Faint tremors occurred inside the park, but luckily no one was near. Suddenly, he looked upwards. Seeing nothing but the pitch black sky, eyed devoid of any kind of feeling and light. Letting those bad emotions inside of him take control, he summoned the boosted gear. That surprised and scared Drake. He knew what his partner wanted to do. He thought that they had lost it after gaining a new power. But it seemed that it was still there. The juggernaut drive. But the voice that came from the grave. A voice that seemed to reach the deepest depths of the entirety of hell. He chanted, I, who am about to awaken, partner. Wait, don't do it. They are not worthy of you sacrificing your life to ensure their destruction. Listen to me. Is this really how you want everything to end? The dragon hurriedly said to his partner, clearly worried. At the same time he felt anger and disgust towards those women. Yet the answer of his partner was only another chant. I'm the heavenly dragon who has stolen the principles of domination from God. Shit. Partner, listen to my voice. Is this what you want killing innocent people that did nothing wrong except being in the wrong place at the wrong time? You are better than this. Show them not by destroying but by your own strength that you are different from what they say. Noticing that the next part of the chant was not coming as quickly as before, he knew his partner was still there. Broken beyond repair, but still there. There wasn't much time, the next part of the chant was soon heard. I laugh at the infinite, and I grieve at the dream. This time the chant came more abruptly, as if he didn't want to continue. Drake took advantage of it. Partner. He say. Please don't do it. I know you are suffering. I know you want revenge, but this is not the way. Breaking his speech, the next part of the chant became present. I shall become the red dragon of domination. Come on, Issei. Come back to you senses. You're the best possessor of the boosted gear in history. The one with the greatest potential. The one I dare to call a friend. Don't you dare go down that path that leaves nothing but pain and agony. He was desperate. Don't you dare leave after all we have been through. I know you can overcome this, just like you always have my friend. So show me one more time, how high do Issei makes the impossible possible. As the words of Drake finished the chant also stopped, the glowing and trembling of the park was now gone. The boosted gear dissipated, becoming red particles of light. Issei fell down, barely conscious, he was breathing and sweating heavily. So I am your friend Drake good to know I at least have someone I can trust. Thanks for everything, and sorry about scaring you. We can speak about that later, I am going to faint being his last words of the day he felt asleep. One couldn't blame him, after all, this day was just horrible. As always you make me worry, but I could not have asked for a better partner. He sighed in relief. Better rest to say, because that darkness you showed is something that will make you even stronger. Ha 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 ha. I cannot wait to tell you about it, young Drake. Saying those words with so much pride and arrogance, Drake decided to rest as well. If he is capable of mastering that darkness, then we would have a new heavenly dragon running around the world. Those were his thoughts. Inside the bathtub a young man recalled past memories. Some parts of said memories made him cry, while others made him faintly smile. Ah quite the memory. He thought. After that, I woke up in the middle of the park, having slept there for about a day. Luckily for me, my parents went on a cruise trip around America after the evil dragon campaign, so I don't know when they will come back. Also those women do not care about me, so questions were not asked. Spitting out the last part with a painful look and real actual pain in his, he looked at the reverse of his left palm. Something was telling him that his resident was awake. Recalling memories partner. The dragon spoke to him. Yeah and not the good ones, I just remembered that day, he answered back to the dragon inside of his head. Partner, you should leave that behind. It's been far too long and you are still in a horrible state. 
The pieces are also acting correspondingly to your state. You do not have much longer left. Scoffing at the comment of Drake, he mentally answered. HMPH. What are you talking about? I feel great. There is no need to worry. Issei quickly answered with false security in his voice. Also, if what you said is true then I have not much time left. The corruption in my body is proof enough. Maybe when I'm gone they will at least feel a tiny bit bad all of them. The tone used in that comment was devoid of any emotion, as if his life or death didn't matter to him in the slightest. Partner, please stop trying to destroy yourself. If you do not do something about those pieces then, the continuous clash between them and your dragon's aura will burn you from the inside out. Drake tried to bring some sense into that thick skull of his. The current Beelzebub has not asswered your magic circles, and I'm pretty sure you will need to get rid of them by the end of the week, before it's far too late. Drake told to say, worry spread all over his voice. Over the past month, he has been trying to contact any one of the upper echelons, just to find a solution to his problem. But either the magic circle does not connect, or they just plainly ignore him. He tried everyone, Grafia, Serzich's even Azazel Sensei, but not once has it succeeded. Greg also tried to contact Fafner, but he was still in deep sleep due to the final battle against Rizadam. After trying that much, even reaching the extreme of asking Rias to call her brother for him, in which she just answered, there's no need to bother on Isama, Ice. So please do no come and ask me again, I am very busy. I'm sure your problem will be solved in time. He just gave up, and if Dreg was right, then he had around three days left before his death. The way she spoke to him as if he was just another pebble on the road, made his corruption increase in size and obviously in pain. She did not even let him talk about his problem and just dismissed him. Even when he told her it was a life and death situation, she didn't bat an eyelid. Trying to ask Akeno to contact Barakiel was even worse. She didn't even take the calls from Issei, whether from the magic circle or from the cell phone. Later on, she completely ignored him. Even when he tried to look for her, she was always gone, nowhere to be seen even inside his house. Taking his luck with Asia also was horrible. She only spoke to him about club-related affairs, and with everything else she just said, please leave Isan, I have a meeting to attend to with the student council. Or Isan, someone is waiting for me so please leave before they come of course, understanding that the bastard heard about that night was coming. He no longer was dumb or foolish. With this kind of experience in life, he did not have the luxury of being like that. Zenovia and Arena were also the same, but both of them were much more cold towards him. Once, when he tried to explain his situation, both of them gave him a look as if he was garbage, even some killing intent was felt during that time. They only said one word to him, leave. They roared towards him, threatening to do something else if he didn't abide by their words. Ravel was just a lost cause, not a word was spoken, she just always ignored him. She didn't even have the decency to look at him when she saw him. An echo, well let's just say she was really aggressive when spoken to, she only looked at him with anger in her eyes. Not courageous enough to try her patience, he always left. He tried to contact Serzich's, but every single time he tried it did not connect. Maybe the line was secure and only contact could be established if he made it first. It was different from the others he had called. But well, he was a faction leader, so something needed to be done in other to protect himself. To the other Mao, a duke of Beelzebub, the magic circle was answered by his secretary. Something like that. But just like a professional the secretary told him that he wasn't available for the moment and always cut the call. That pissed him off, but there was nothing he could do. So he swallowed whatever pride he had left and managed to leave a message after much effort, stating that the evil pieces were malfunctioning and it was urgent to call him back. However, that was a long time ago and the Mag hadn't called him back. He also believed that the secretary didn't put attention to him, so he was doubtful if he even recorded the message. He tried to contact Lafay through their contract, but he couldn't sense anything from it, as if it was dead. Something was telling him that she cut their link while maintaining the contract intact, how she did that was beyond him. Hiroka, after the job offer from Yasaka, which she actually accepted, was also the same. Her magical signature was erased, he wasn't capable of finding it. So even if he wanted to and he really did, he couldn't contact her. According to Drake, only that could happen if one's magical signature is experiencing a change similar to changing cell phone numbers. Rafia, like Roswis, was also unreachable. It seemed that whatever she was doing she didn't want to be interrupted, so her magic circle was always off, in other words, useless. Azazel Sensei was the most annoying one. He didn't know how, but he managed to get a voicemail. And an extremely annoying one added. He was even shameless enough to say, please leave a message after the tone but, even with that stupid thing he still called him many times, he even left a couple of messages in his voicemail. He tried everything with everyone. Every single path he and Drag had thought off, he tried it. Yet every time a window was opened, it just slammed shut right on his face. All of those things were around less than a month ago, so he decided to give up. 
His lack of self-worth and the emotions he felt turned him into a walking corpse, soon to be one six feet under. After trying that much no one of them knew about his corruption, and now he did not care. Dibba was gone because of the contracts he had to do, and when he did saw him he was just too beaten to even stand much less talk back. Asper practically left the house and started to live at the hospital. So all of his plans turned out useless, all of them were. Walking out of the bathtub he went to his changing room, but before he managed to put his clothes on, he looked at a full body mirror. What he saw made him cry. He looked far too bad. His once scrawny body came back, and now it looked even worse. His skin now stuck to his bones and his entire body was pale white, as if he hadn't gone out in weeks. The bags under his eyes were terrible, even the look of his eyes held no light as if dead. But the worst were eight jet black, swirling, pulsing hollis in his body. These were his corruption. Corruption, as he had decided to call it, were the eight evil spots where his evil pieces were inside his body. And those eight spots were the origin of the venom that was slowly killing him. Each one of them was in a specific part in his body. One in each arm and leg, for a total of four. The rest were divided into two segments. The first segment was that of a single piece in each side of his and one in the hole where the ribs joined, taking the form of an inverse triangle. The second segment was conformed of a single piece just below his belly button and his navel. According to Drag, the pieces by some way or another malfunctioned and were blocked out of the boosted gear, not allowing their use at all. However, that was in the beginning when all of those women no longer had even the decency of talking to him. But after that fateful day, things started to change. After the awakening of his aura, things got worse. Because of the nature of his aura, which was to protect him. It fraught against the nature of the pieces that were trying to kill him. Due to the clash of energy inside his body, as well as the almost use of the juggernaut drive, the pieces were further corrupted and became eight militia spots inside his body, which his only goal was to feed off of his life force. Leaving him as a mummy in the best case scenario and in the worst, he would turn into dust blown by the wind. When he heard that explanation from Drake he almost pissed his pants, but later on he stopped caring, no one would miss him except a few, but after taking a look back into the mirror, he finally broke. He could no longer mask his emotions, his pain. He was like Drake said, just too damn broken. Grabbing the last piece of sanity he had left, he asked in between tears. Drake what can we do? Surprised by the question of the brown-haired boy, but also happy, Drake answered. There is something we can do. It occurred to me a while ago, but you were in far too bad of a shape to listen to me. Also, if this goes wrong then you will die in a horrible way. Your body will explode, and by the force of the clash between auras your soul will dissipate. You will literally become nothing. Are you sure? Looking at himself in the mirror once again he thought for a moment, but he quickly made his decision. What does he have to lose? Tell me Drake. What exactly is this crazy idea of yours? A savage grin adorning his face, something the dragon really liked to finally see. Fine. Have you ever heard of the theory of opposing forces? Interested by the sudden question, Issei answered. No. Not in the slightest. With a goofy grin he proudly stated. After this we need to make you more knowledgeable. Even the smallest piece of knowledge could save your life. The dragon said with pity in his voice. His partner really needed to read more, or at least to travel more. Maybe that way he wouldn't be that ignorant. Well, moving on. He left those thoughts for another time. The theory of opposing force states that if two directly opposing forces meet, the one that has the most energy will win. Completely pushing the other force back. That's why the corruption exists inside your body. Right now the evil pieces are winning and destroying your body little by little. We need to make the opposite occur. Impressed by the words of the dragon, Issei swallowed his spit. He knew this was something bad. Wait, are you proposing to increase my dragonic powers so that they win against the evil pieces? Asked Issei. Yes. That is correct. With seriousness the dragon answered in a flash. You crazy bastard. He yelled. The evil pieces are connected to my body and soul. Since you are part of my soul by failing the suicide attempt you will also be gone with me. Crazily howled the boy towards the dragon. Yes, that certainly is true. He agreed with his words. But why would I care? I'm already a soul inside a sacred gear. Dying with you, my best friend and host would certainly be better than being stuck here, knowing I could have saved my friend. The dragon said towards Issei. You crazy bastard Issei muttered under his lips, trying to hide his smile. He was happy about having such a friend. Never could I've asked for a better partner. And even better friend. Hesitating would be an insult towards your resolve. He said. I'm all ears. How can we do that? Issei asked Drag with tears of happiness across his face. About that. There is a way for us to weaken them, but is really, realicracy. I doubt it will work not very confident about himself, Drag told Issei. Okay, tell me about our suicide attempt. Whatever it takes we shall do it. After all, neither of us has something to lose. Ahahaha. <laughs> Truly my partner. He laughed for the first time in a while. Okay, listen up. 
The pieces suck the life force out of your body and into them. So what would happen if we suddenly cut the supply of all eight of them and at the same time connect it directly to the nucleus of your aura? Theoretically, the pieces will weaken and your aura will increase. Drake told him his theory. Even in the eyes of him, a crazy boy with nothing to lose, this was suicide. Severing the life force apply and then reconnecting it into his nucleus. Just by severing his life force, it will instantly kill him. Even if he survived long enough for the supply to be reconnected. Just how long was that? Seconds, minutes, hours. Yes. I know what you are thinking, but have you forgotten? One of your aura's natures are regeneration and healing. Maybe, just maybe, that can keep you alive long enough for me to reconnect your life force into your nucleus. The dragon told his host with hope in his voice. Greg you're telling me to cut the connection between my life force and my body. In other words, cut the connection of my soul and my body. Then reattach it, but leaving the pieces aside only connecting it to my nucleus. Are you trying to be a doctor when you grow up this is basically extremely complex surgery, on my soul. The say roared at Drag, but after breathing for a little while, he calmed down. Okay, okay. Let's say I manage to stay alive with the help of my aura. What will happen to you? You are part of my soul. The sacred gear system made that obvious. Well, theoretically, I will enter deep sleep, and the boosted gear will reboot itself. Just like if it was searching for a new host. But it will be inside your body, so it will not take much time for me to awaken. However, every progress you have made with the boosted gear so far will be gone, I also do not know what kind of side effects will it have to the sacred gear system or yourself. Wow so it would suck either way huh? Issei said as he laid his body in the bed. Although for him it felt like more than a day had passed, little above two hours actually went by since he woke up. Time really is slow. Okay, I'll bite. Where can we do this? If anything you said is right then the amount of energy or least will alert someone in the town. Using a magic circle might not be the brightest of ideas. After all, my body ice a mess. Accepting the dragon's proposal, the boy asked. Well, the energy needed for a transportation circle is really small. Even smaller if you do not specify a location, unless you target somewhere that is not part of the human world. So you could make one targeting a random part of the human world and probably not die. The red dragon answered. You are saying theoretically, probably and possibly a lot. Not too convincing. Issei said, almost resigning himself to fate. After some seconds of thinking things through, he gave up. Well, let's do it. Better now than never. Issei jumped off his bed with one hand above his head. Managing to get a drop of sweat in the back of the neck of the Red Dragon Emperor. Truly, his host was something else entirely. Well partner, don't you want to leave a will or something behind? A letter, message, anything. You sound as if I'm going to die during this he annoyingly replied back, the dragon just kept his silence. How is resigning himself to the dragon's proposal, he said. True maybe I should. Then, he went to look for something. Searching inside his room, he found what he was looking for. Inside a drawer at the left side of his bed, a circular machine was present with two buttons onto it, red and black. It was a holographic recorder, something as is a left the last time he came here, drunk. When he first saw it he took it since it looked interesting to him, never would have he thought to actually use it, at least not this way. Pressing the red button he started to record, a light shining towards him is proof of the machine actually working. A few minutes later he stopped the recording, having said everything needed to be said. Even about his corruption and their plan named suicide attempt. He sighed and left the recorder at the top of his desk, at the far left of where his bed was. Well, Drake. Let's do this. Issei said with excitement in his voice, trying to mask the absolute dread and fear he felt. Although he couldn't cheat his partner, the answer he heard from him made him feel a little better. Fine. Since you seem so eager to do it, and before the adrenaline boost in both of us is gone, let's do it. Drag replied. Set up the magic circle. After that, search for an isolated location. I'll start to gather the necessary energy for cutting your life force off of the pieces. Once I'm done, I'll tell you. Best of luck partner, we both will need it cutting his link with his host, Drag got to work. Not wasting a second, Issei made the magic circle onto the ground of his room and stepped inside it, hoping for the best to happen. Forest somewhere in Europe, light briefly flashed in the middle of a rather creepy forest. After a couple of seconds the shinning passed, and a young man with brown hair was left in its place. Well quite the random location, I'll give you that. Luckily my corruption did not act up, so I fell rather good. Issei said to no one in particular as he started to look around him. The entirety of his surroundings were colored in either green or brown. Except for the sky that was a rather dark blue with a tinge of orange. Clearly, whatever forest this was, night was approaching, and fast. Beginning to walk around without a specific direction, he started to look for the location he was thinking of. He moved in between tall trees dozens of feet high, but still not high enough to cover the entirety of the sky. 
The ground was soft, it was clearly obvious that rain was abundant in this place. Moss grew here and there, and the wind was cold as well as the climate in general. But snow was nowhere to be seen. Continuing his walk in what he thought was an endless forest. Am. This place is huge. I have walked for a while, yet not a single decent spot has been found. Is my luck really that bad grabbing his head in between his hands, he yelled. Please, any place is fine. I just want it to be isolated enough. Screaming at the forest. He started to spin around in anxiety. Feeling dizzy, he fell to the ground. The soft soil, moss and grass fortunately alleviated his fall. Opening his eyes with some tiredness, he looked upwards. Before him laid one of the most beautiful sights he had ever seen, and oddly enough, it filled him with peace, calming his mind. The view was that of the clear night sky, in a dark imperial blue not black. Stars filled his vision and wherever he set his eyes on laid a bright star. The full moon hung high and was proudly displaying its arrogance with its light and beauty. A few comets flew by the sky, painting their trail like in a canvas. It was the first time Issei had ever seen the starry sky. He had no words to say. Not even a thought flew by his head. He stood up and looked around, quickly finding a big rock to sit on. Approaching his target, he sat on it and looked upwards. For the first time in the past couple of horrible months, he felt happy, he felt peace. And in a brief moment, he felt something change inside of him. Now he felt he had a goal. He wanted to see the world. If only the sight of a random forest in a random part of the world was this breathtaking. Then how about other places famous throughout the world? What about the supernatural world? What about Asgard? Grigori? Takamagahara? And so many others. He now knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to travel. To see with his own eyes how truly beautiful this world, filled with mysteries was. Standing up from the rock light filled his eyes. His former dead look was now completely gone, being replaced with a resolute look filled with a certain wisdom in life. Giving him, in his rather deplorable state, a handsome hint. Continuing his journey, he walked while staring at the sky, the stars being his guide. A while later, he found what he was looking for. The mountain now stood in front of him, deeply rooted into the earth. Although it wasn't big, by no means was it small. Heading towards it, Issei thought. Well, it seems that Lady Luck finally smiled at me. With a smile he looked towards what it looked like a cave. Stepping closer he confirmed his suspicions, it truly was a cave. The Luu, screaming at the cave, the echo resounded for a little while, it proved that this cave was deep within the mountain and deep within the earth, similar to a mine. But he knew it wasn't, after all, no sign of human civilization was found when he started his journey into the forest. So one could guess this cave was a natural formed one. Hiding his excitement he walked inwards. The scenery slowly changed. The light of the moon no longer was present, but with his night vision he could perfectly see. The wet cavern was what he was walking in. Only the echo of the drops of water falling from stalactites to the ground and a couple of animal sounds could be heard. His footsteps slowly took over the noise fight inside the cavern as he walked deeper in. Now he understood why Volley liked to see new places and explore the world. It was exciting. Interesting. But best of all, relaxing. He could lay his worries aside when doing this, not letting a single negative thought get inside his head. This could be addicting. Thought the brown-haired man to himself. But soon after, another voice woke him up from his monologue. Partner, I finished. I gathered all the energy I could from the boosted gear, and once we reach the location we can start. But there is something I need to ask you. Said Drake with rare seriousness and his voice catching the explorer off guard. Sure partner. What do you want to talk about? Since they were alone, he had no fear of speaking loudly to his friend. This will be hard the dragon thought to himself. Partner, after this, what do you want to do? Will you return to them? Will you give up? Will you seek revenge? Drake cautiously asked the last part to his partner. The safe froze when he heard that. He stopped his walk and looked at the green glow in his palm, staying completely silent for minutes until he spoke up. I do not know. Issei replied. He truly didn't know what he wanted to do. Seeking revenge was pleasurable but rather empty. After that, then what? Being hunted by half of the supernatural world. Nah, it isn't worth it. If he really did get revenge then, what was the difference between him and them? He wanted to prove he was different from anything and from anyone, but that dark path wasn't on his mind. If he wanted revenge then it will be by his own way, not slaughtering everything in his path like a mindless beast. He was curious though. Why did they do that? Why did they choose to leave him? But now, it wasn't in his list of priorities. If he was like before he would have looked for answers even if blood stained his hands, but different questions filled his head. What do I want to do? That was his first thought. Will I turn back? For what purpose? Being pushed back and scorned for what I once was. Issei started to think deeply to himself, something he hadn't done in a long while. I must agree, my attitude wasn't the best. But still is not enough to treat me like that. His eyes were shining with anger. To speak behind my back like that. 
to treat me as a disposable shield like that. To insult and hurt me like that. Issei thought while clenching his fists. Anger filled him, but he did not let it control him, not anymore. He wanted to become stronger, to become someone feared and respected. So he came up with his decision. I will change, and I'll show you all how wrong you were. That was his answer. I will no longer be a joke. I will no longer be kicked around and be led by the nose. I will become someone you will not underestimate, and I will show you all the might of a dragon. That will be my revenge. Seeing his partner in deep thought, the dragon did not say anything else. He was worried over the decision his partner will make. He didn't want his partner to seek revenge that never solved anything. Rather it left even more pain to those involved. Although he couldn't see his partner's thoughts, he could feel his emotions. Determination, pride, decisiveness and for once in a long time happiness. He now knew what decision his partner made, and damn was he proud and happy. Now was the time to hear the answer from him. But secretly he already knew the answer. Greg's suspense filled his voice. That made the dragon put all of his attention to his words. I want to do what I want. Like a true dragon. His words echoed with strength all over the cave. I do not want to be a slave, following a spoiled little girl that thinks she is the best. I no longer want to be led by the nose by someone else. I want to become a true leader with his own team. I want to journey around the world and see how beautiful it is. Issei screamed with all the power he had in his body. But first and foremost he inhaled deeply. I do not want to be treated as an ignorant, naive, foolish, perverted boy. I want to be treated with respect, with seriousness, and like how I truly deserve ITTTTT. His scream turned into a roar, a true dragon's roar that echoed within the cave, shaking the entire mountain and the forest. He looked like a beast freed from its bindings. Greg was stupefied, the answer he guessed was completely off the mark. But the answer given to him by his partner filled him with eagerness, pride and many more emotions. He was happy that his friend and host wanted to do that. Now he was finally maturing and acting like a true dragon should. Not saying anything, the dragon let his friend unburden himself. After the echo of the roar disappeared, he finally spoke. Partner he couldn't hide the smile in his face. I could not agree with you more. Finally you left behind that self-destructive attitude you had. Finally are you willing to change for the good. Finally you are acting like a ing dragon should. Drag roared at Issei. But instead of intimidating, it was supportive and filled with eagerness to get already started. Move ahead Issei. There are still things we need to do before accomplishing the goals we have imposed on ourselves. Regaining his composure Drake told Issei. The faster they get these things out of him, the faster they can start on their new goal. Walking ahead Issei didn't say anything else, words no longer mattered to them. Finally reaching the end of the cave he found himself looking upwards, seeing a tiny hole in which the moonlight shone upon him, leaving a rather dramatic scene. Recompassing himself, he asked. Well Drake we finally reached the end, let's get this started. So what's the plan? Good. Listen, partner. He began explaining. First, since you were capable of drawing a teleportation circle I need you to draw something else. Do not worry, the magic used in this type of magic circle is small. The problem is that it will take a while to finish it, maybe a couple of hours. Drake said to his partner as he sent the image of the magic circle. He was hoping he will make it in a short while. Issei started to get to work as soon as he got the image from Drake. The circle was really complex with many intricate crisscrossing lines with different widths. But each line used a really small amount of energy, finishing it will not consume anything from his reserves. Which, after getting his aura, became much more than that of the average high-class devil. Maybe if he survived, in the short term, said reserves will go up reaching what an ultimate class devil should have. Also, the consumption of making the circle seemed to be d really small, so his corruption wouldn't act up. Well, at least he hoped it wouldn't. Not allowing any distracting thoughts come into his head, he continued the drawing of the circle. Just as Drake said, it did not consume anything, but because of the complexity of it, it took a while for the circle to be ready, maybe three or four hours. He wasn't sure since he was in a cave, and perceiving time was rather difficult. Well Drake, I finally finished it. Now will you explain what it does? Issei asked his resident hoping to figure out what exactly was he drawing for the past couple of hours. Sure, partner. This magic circle was designed by a past possessor. A true genius in the magic field. But he perished too early, succumbing to my power and dying when he used the juggernaut drive. Drake told his host as he recalled memories, and not pleasant ones. Wow. So a senpai made this, no wonder it's so complex. But what does it do? I was getting to it. He replied with a deadpan tone. What it does is simple, it absorbs whatever type of energy the environment has at a rapid pace, and then transfers it to a single attack, spell, or anything you want. You could call it a power generator. Issei was surprised that something like this actually existed. It sounded like a really powerful spell. But it has many flaws. The dragon stopped his thoughts. 
1. It can only be used one time per day. 2. The time needed to actually create it, making it not useful during a fight. And, if you are not able of maintaining control over it, it will dispel during its use, and it will consume the try for the day. He told him the information. So failed product was born. But since it caught my attention, I memorized it. Never thought it would be useful. Drake answered in a rather carefree tone of voice. So in the end, what will we use it for? He asked his partner again, not understanding why he drew this for the last couple of hours. Ha ah, Drake sighed. Not sure how you could be so sharp sometimes, but at others truly dumb. Drake said to his partner, not understanding this mystery and the life of his friend. Hey. I'm working on it. Once we get out of here, I will spend the rest of my time in the library. I believe there's one in my house. Isairi toured but not entirely sure about the last part of his sentence. He did believe that in such a huge mansion a library should be present, but he didn't know where. Greg ignored his words and decided to answer his former question. After gathering all the energy I could from the boosted gear, I believe it will not be enough to completely cut your life force from eight evil pieces. Instead, I made you prepare this magic circle, so that I could gather the necessary energy to completely cut them off for good, since during the procedure, I will not be able to accumulate more energy. Dr. Drake quickly told his partner. But before Issei could speak, Drake interrupted him. I also do not know what effects it will bring to your body. In the short and long run. Those words made him keep silence. So my advice is to always remain conscious during this no matter what. Even if your body is shredded apart. Issei swallowed some spit. Also, only use your aura to make your heartbeat and heal any damage done to it. Only do that or it will make the evil pieces act up and destroy you instantly. I am serious about this. Drake bombarded Issei with new information that wasn't pleasing to the ear at all. So I should always remain conscious, no matter what. No. Matter. What. If you lose your consciousness for even a second, then we will both die. Do not worry, I'll be as quick as possible, but something as delicate as this will take its time. Drake said as fast as possible, showing his seriousness. How long will it be? Give me an approximate, I need to prepare myself. Issei asked in a serious tone of voice. He knew this matter was no joking, and even the slightest misstep would end in agony and death for both of them. The answer he got wasn't what he expected. Two hours minimum. Or 15 minutes per piece, give or take a few. That is the approximate time I calculated for this process. Feeling as if a truck just hit him, Issei was out of breath. He did not know how painful it would be, but he knew it will not be pretty. Maybe even worse than the Curseus ammo he experienced when fighting Shalba. His instinct telling him it will be worse far much worse. So partner, are you ready for the suicide attempt as you called it? It will not be pretty, but it will save your life I hope. Drake said to his friend, but keeping the last part to himself as he didn't want to discourage him. After what he felt like an eternity, Issei gathered his courage and crazily said. Bring it on Drake. I will survive, so you better make it as well. I do not know what will happen to you after all. Worry not partner, since I am a soul that does not have a body I will feel nothing. But I warn you that you will not see me for a while. After all, this could be interpreted as moving to another host. Drake said to him. Issei could feel that the dragon was anxious as well. Oh yeah, during the process, I will not be able to communicate with you. So you will be on your own. Therefore, I will not say goodbye, I will only say, see you soon partner. Now let's start this. Hearing the words of his partner anchored him even more. Even the roar at the end was a nice touch. Yeah. Let's do this. Scene change inside the cave a couple of seconds after, the magic circle was activated at the end of those words. Light filled the cavern, and an extremely dense and powerful red-colored aura surrounded Issei. Widening his eyes so much they turned bloodshot, Issei swallowed the scream of despair he felt. Definitely much worse than the curse of Samuel by a few times. His body cramped up and fell to the ground, twitching continuously as if he had spasms. Now he was completely laying down on the ground wanting to scream, but thanks to the fierce glint in his eyes, he swallowed the scream back down. Seconds after that, his skin started to dry up. His former pale color turned blood red because of the effort of resisting the torture. Soon after cracks and cuts started to appear on his skin, as if an extremely sharp knife cut him horizontally and vertically. Blood flowed and it started to taint the floor of the cave red. As time moved on more cuts appeared on his skin. His aura started to act automatically trying to heal those wounds, but he stopped it. Controlling it, he focused it on his heart instead. His right arm started to emit an extreme amount of heat, yet no flames were seen. The area around his right bicep was the one that started to act more violently, but the scene in front of his eyes made his brain short-circuit momentarily. Little by little at the center of his bicep where his corruption was, a bright red pawn piece with black spots that was releasing a dreadful aura was coming out. Soon after it flew from his bicep as if shot out from it. He quickly turned his head, following the pawn piece, only to see it land on the wall, a part of it getting stuck. 
the scene left him stupefied, but soon after his wound slowly started to heal. His aura was not the reason since it was firmly encased in his heart. An idea came to his head. Maybe Drake reconnected the part of his life force that belonged to that pawn piece back to his nucleus, making it heal his wounds. Well, that was what he came up with, since that may be the only reasonable explanation. Not gaining a single second for a break, the torture continued, yet this time it felt worse. Maybe the rest of the pieces knew what was happening. He quickly concentrated his aura, healing his heart, making it to continuously beat. He needed to concentrate even if it was impossible. A second time came, he felt as if his spine was crushed, his tendons torn and his hair ripped from his skull, maybe because it actually happened. His spine was compressed and then released, violently changing shape in less than a second. His bones, trying to withstand the procedure and the clash of power inside his body, broke into multiple pieces, turning into fragments. If he was anything less than a dragon, that alone was sufficient to kill him. His tendons were completely snapped as if cut with a sharp knife, making him lose his sense of touch in his arms and legs. The hair from his skull started to fall in large batches, as if someone just ripped it apart. Soon after, in his left bicep, the same event happened. Quickly another pawn piece flew from his body, this time landing on the floor a few meters away. Only 30 minutes had passed since the beginning of his torture, seen change more than an hour later, the say was finally at the end. His torture was finally ending, but the last piece still needed to be extracted. The surroundings were filled with nothing but blood, hair, sweat and tears. Proof of the hell he experienced while still living. He had to accept it, a few times he almost lost consciousness, but his iron-like will woke him up, letting him avoid the worst-case scenario. What was once a cave was nowhere to be seen. As if a battle happened inside this place, everything was filled with either cracks or holes. Being among them seven obvious craters, in which, at the center, one could see a bright red pawn piece with black spots, emitting a dreadful aura. The black aura was rising up into the air covering a part of the ceiling just like smoke. At the center of the cave, laid the figure of a boy with nothing covering neither his torso nor his feet. The only piece of clothing left was some blood-soaked pants that were destroyed, a couple of parts missing on them. One could see his slowly rising and falling, barely breathing. Yet now, in that terrible state, he looked more alive than before. Most of his corruption was now gone, the single last spot of it being the one at his heart. That pitch black, swirling, pulsing spot was the last one, and at the same time the most dangerous one of them. During the past hour and 45 minutes, he experienced tortures no living being would be able to withstand. It did not matter whether they were humans or devils, he guaranteed that no one will be able to survive it. Yet now even after all of that, he was scared. Each expulsion of an evil piece got worse than the one before, so he didn't know what exactly was what awaited him. The last expulsion almost broke him, mentally and physically. It was really close. If it lasted a second more then he would no longer be among the living, and even if he was, he would no longer be sane. Healing his wounds heal he looked around, seeing nothing but either cracks, holes or blood. It was so much of it that he didn't believe that it was from him. Maybe his life force was also recovering his loss of blood. Who would know? His hair was much longer, reaching below his shoulders, it was a tone much more darker than before but still brown. Maybe all the energy used in this experiment and the stress he felt left him with the secondary effect of a darker hair. He didn't exactly cared about it. His hair, even after this, still maintained the same style he had. He really needed to do something about it, he looked awful with those twin tails. His eyes, because of the constant activity of his demon mark, were black with a tinge of red looking really intimidating and scary. But before he could continue appreciating his appearance in a blood pool by his side, the healing was done. Mentally preparing himself for the worst, he never knew what got him, seen change unknown, Issei opened his eyes. In front of him was nothing but darkness. He looked around and saw himself floating on an endless obscurity. For a moment he thought that he almost had it. He almost succeeded. He started to cry, tears falling from his face. He felt awful especially towards Drake, he had failed him, his best friend, and now they were both gone, dead. Sorry pal. It seems I wasn't able to do it please forgive me, I dragged you down with me, tears of regret and sadness were falling down on both of his s. Before continuing his monologue he was abruptly interrupted. Flash, light filled his surroundings, blinding him momentarily. He quickly closed his eyes as a reflex. When he opened them back up. He was back in Kuo. He was in the orc, talking to Rias and Akeno. He remembered this scene, it was that from that fateful and horrible day. How many times had he dreamt of this very scene? How many nightmares? How many night terrors? He didn't know. The scene changed. He now was standing behind his past self, inside Kuo College Division. He was seeing that day from a third-person point of view. Just like a spectator. He was inside the faculty Rias and Akeno studied at. He could see his former self peeking from the tiny gap between the door. He could see how his Issy's face slowly morphed into that of anger, agony, sadness, and despair. 
Not being able to continue watching, he quickly turned around. Why did I had to remember this disgusting scene now that I am dying? Really shitty luck. Disgust followed his words as he turned back around at his former self. He could see how his past me had eyes filled with disbelief. Soon after, Issei stood up and started to walk towards the stairs, walking past his side not noticing him in the slightest. It seemed that his former self could not see him. Deciding to follow him, not sure why, Issei walked away and after him. Soon, he stood at the bottom of the stairs. He could see how his past self fell to the ground and was breathing heavily. The look on his face was really bad, even for him to say. He did not want to experience this again. It hurt far too much. Shit. Get away from here. You should go back home. Listen to Drake and get away. Issei was screaming at himself. Yet he couldn't hear him, he was still sitting there. After a little while, his former self stood up and weakly walked towards the door. Shit. Keep moving. We need to get out of here. This disgusting place is making me feel sick. Issei continued to scream at himself. His words never reached him. Heading out the door, they crossed the campus and reached the metal gate. Yes. Finally out of that hellhole. Issei was finally relaxing a bit, but before he could say anything else, his face lost color. He could see his former self running towards the park. No. Don't go theory. Screaming with everything he got, he tried to stop him. But seeing that it was useless he started to run in the opposite direction, however, it was futile. His legs moved, yet he didn't actually advance from his position. He felt how his body was coming closer and closer to his former self, just like in a nightmare. No. Please, don't make me go back theory. He screamed as tears and snot were falling down his face, but it was pointless. Trying to run away he kept failing. Instead he was getting closer and closer to the center of the park, where he and C was. Stopping his futile attempts at escaping, he looked around, trying to find his former self. That was the only thing he could do. He was trembling all over. Sweat started to accumulate in his forehead and fell down his dot chills continuously circulated around his spine. He could also see how his skin was getting goosebumps and his hair was standing on end. The clattering of his teeth was the only sound coming from him. He suddenly stopped. He could see his former self laying down on a bench. Then he quickly hid behind it, inside a bush. He knew this scene too well. Just how many times had he dreamt about the same scene? He could feel how the blood in his body was replaced with ice. He, slowly, like a rusty machine, turned around. Earthy R. No please don't let me see this again I beg you. Please don't. I don't want to experience this again. Begging to whatever deity he thought of he went on his knees, his arms hugging his head, as if trying to protect himself from the scene. But as soon as he turned his head back up, he saw that he was now at the side of his former self. Please see. Don't. Screaming at his other self as he saw how he was peeking at them through the bush, he threw himself at the former Issei, but to his surprise, he simply went through him. Now laying flat onto the ground, right behind his former self. He got up and stood in front of his former self, as if trying to block his view. His past self completely ignored him, as if he was nothing but air. You dumb piece of before continuing his profanities he could see how Issei coughed out blood. He knew why. Some time before he had done it as well. Turning around he saw the scene that haunted his memories till this day. The four women were talking among themselves, a normal conversation for anyone. But for him, each word was like a sharp knife digging straight towards his heart. He tried to turn around but he couldn't. Just like when he tried to ran away something compelled him to look. Tears fell down his face. His breath turned heavy, he could feel how his body was shutting itself down. He continued to watch, the whole lot of it. But at some point tears stopped forming in his eyes, he no longer cared. Suddenly, a chill went down his spine. He turned back and saw his former self being surrounded by a miasma, black with red tints, shining in a violet light at intervals. But that was not what scared him, rather, what happened afterward. Oh no please don't tell me, that is going to happen. He could see his former self's second skin break. Releasing a terrible miasma that covered the entirety of the city. That actually happened Drag never told me that. But the pale face he looked towards his past self. He saw him summon the boosted gear and reciting that chant. Wait. Don't activate that. Just how many innocents will be lost if you activate it. Yelling at his past self, he tried to move, but his body did not respond to him. The shock from experiencing that scene again was still present in his body, and because of that, he couldn't move properly. Shit. Move body. Movie. I need to stop him before he does something he will regret even after dead. He tried to move. However, it was useless, his body did not respond. Damn it. I said, move. Breaking free from whatever rooted him in place, he slowly moved towards his past self. Yes. Finally. I won't let something like this happen. Yelling in an even louder voice that before, he slowly walked towards his past self who now was on the third part of the chant. Closing in on him he suddenly couldn't move, darkness filled his vision and he couldn't see anything. He merely closed his eyes as a reflex. 
when he opened them back up he saw them. Every single one was right in front of him, stopping him from reaching his past self. The chance started to slow down. His past self was fighting against it with whatever will he had left. Shit. All of Yao Gain. Scram out of my way. He screamed towards them, but it did not work. Then, for the first time since coming to this place, he heard a voice. It came from in front of him, more specifically from Rhea's Gremory. Standing not more than a meter away. Her entire sclera along with her iris was black, giving her a terrifying look. Now, now, Issei. You better get away before you get H-U-R-T after all, there is nothing a dumb pervert like you can do. With a calm voice that sounded sweet but extremely cold, Rhea said to Issei. The words he heard from her felt like a knife in his gut, stopping him in his tracks. Then he heard a flirty and sharp voice. R-R, Ice K-U-N, you better turn around before we hurt you. After all, you are accustomed to follow orders. Now be a good dog and go B-A-C-K with a sadistic tone Akeno talked to him, her eyes were the same as Rhea's. Those words made Issei feel like throwing up, he felt sick and dizzy. Yet, another voice was heard. Pervert. You better turn around this instant or I'll break you really bad. Zenovia said to him as she cracked her knuckles. Issei was now pale, the trembling came back, but now it was even worse. You heard her filth senpai. You disgust me. This time Kaneko spoke up. Issei no longer was able to stand properly, he fell down on his knees gasping for breath. Yes, Issei kun. Hmm. That doesn't sound right. That voice was filled with venom. Oh. How about filthy kun? Yes. Suits you much better. Just give up, you're not worth a thing. Aside from the boosted gear, you're nothing. Why else do you think we spent all that time with a pervert like you? Irina sharply told Issei the cruel truth. When she said that, all the memories of him spending time with each girl filled his mind. Tears and snot came from his eyes and nose. I sand, how pathetic you look, truly pitiful. So pitiful, I want to laugh, but nothing comes out. Those words came for Asia. She was giving him a horrible smile. Ha I sama. You truly are naive, thinking you could do something. There's nothing you can do. Her voice was cold and sharp. Why am I worried? You are far too dumb and stupid to even think of something. Ha 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 ha. Ravel basically spat at him. Issei was now on the floor, kneeling with an empty look in his eyes. He felt like giving up and listening to their words. He wanted to give up. He really wanted everything to end. His sight started to darken, as if he was going blind. His body felt weak and void of strength. He couldn't even look up. His mind was empty and his will to fight, even after all that he went through, was starting to fade. It was slowly leaving his broken body. The shadows in his surroundings started to hug him, trying to finally claim his life for once and for all. You are the best possessor of the boosted gear in history. The one with the greatest potential, and the one I dare to call a friend. Don't you dare leave after all we have been through. I know you can overcome this just how you always have, my friend. He remembered the words of a certain red dragon. When I come back I have something important to tell you Ice Kun, so please wait. He remembered the last words of a certain white-haired Valkyrie before she went back to the north. They say, we are going on a trip. So while I am gone you are the man of the house. Take care of yourself and become even stronger. Those were the words of his father, he remembered his face right before he left. He wore a straw hat dangling from his neck and a goofy grin on his face. Ice, my sweet boy. Take care. We will be gone for a while, but it won't be that long. Once we come back, let's spend some time together as a family. We love you. He remembered the words of his mother right when they were saying goodbye at him. The moment they left Japan on a cruise ship. The say NYA I'll come back for you. At that time, I'll give you a surprise NYA words from a black-haired kitty, as she hugged him before she went away. I sama. I'll do some missions with my brother and Bali sama before I come back here. Wish me luck. Said a certain female magician as he patted her head as a goodbye. Ice, I will go back to the dimensional gap. There are things I need to think about. The emotionless voice of office as she disappeared inside a spatial crack, going back home. After he remembered all those voices, light came back to his eyes. He stood up, bangs covering his eyes. Surprised by this Rhea's talked back. Mice, pervert. I said, give up. Did you not understand Rhea's talked in a rather loud voice? Shut up. Said Ice with a cold voice that surprised even him. R-A-R-A someone is trying to be rebellious. How about a little punish? I said shut the up. He roared at them. All of them were taken by surprise. The words spoken by Ice were cold and sharp with an overwhelming feeling of dominance. I have taken enough of your bullshit. I am too disgusted to even look at you. So do me a favor and scram from my sight. As he said that his eyes turned black with a tinge of red and his demon mark appeared on his forehead. His hair becoming slightly darker but still brown, a really dark brown. He was finally coming back to himself. HMPH. Someone doesn't know his place. Akeno, Kaneko. Teach him who are his superiors. 
Rias ordered her peerage, but as soon as they reached Issei, they were both lifted from the ground by their necks. Stop sending them to a suicide mission. He scolded. And you too. Stop thinking you're above me. You're pathetically weak, it's you who should know your place. Issei said with his sharp and cold tone of voice. His darkness covered a part of his fingers in both arms. Now, if you excuse me. I have an important event to attend to. So, leave. Increasing his aura, the figures of Rias and her peerage alongside Ravel turned into a black mist. Our releasing a tired sigh Issei looked in front of him. The scene was of his past self who was chanting the fourth part of the juggernaut drive. Steadily walking towards him while his darkness was still active, he stood in front of him. Moving his left arm he placed his hand on his past self's shoulder and said. Don't let something like this destroy you. Don't let words from useless people that have no value hurt you. And foremost, don't you dare let your emotions control you and make innocents pay for their stupidity. Show them how much you are worth. Show them how wrong they were. Don't let vengeance corrupt you. Because if it does, then what is the difference between you and them? With an extremely calm and warm tone of voice, different from his former one, he told his past self. It seemed that those words were also for himself, saying that he was different and that they will no longer affect him. Whatever they do, it no longer mattered to him. Finally feeling like a weight was off his shoulders, he smiled. The weight that was placed on him during that night was finally gone. He smiled, his first real smile after everything he went through. His past self vanished like smoke, the scenery of the park started to break apart like a mirror and disappeared. Everything was gone, only he remained. He felt as if he was standing in the middle of space, nothing could be either felt nor seen, but despite that Issei was feeling calm. Those words and what he just experienced helped him move on, his first real step in his new path. Now was the time to change. He had goals to achieve, and he won't let something like this stop him. At this moment Issei finally changed for the better, the first step towards an unknown future. Scene change back at the cave. One could see a dark brown haired boy laying down on the ground. The black spot swirling in his heart, but said spot started to disappear and in its place a bright crimson pawn piece was sent flying. It made a great arc and landed on the only path in and out of this cave. However, the boy did not woke up after that. One could see a black mark on his forehead, shining in a violet light, yet no signs of life came from the boy. He was dead. Seconds slowly passed, but the boy hadn't moved a muscle. No signs of breathing were seen. More than 10 minutes passed until a bright red aura started to come out from the boy. It was similar to the one that started the entire process, but this one was different, this one was more dark, and even some parts were shining with violet light, giving it a cold feeling. After a few moments, the aura disappeared and the boy opened his eyes. Pant. 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 He started to breath heavily, but he was only capable of that, he still couldn't move. His body was numb. He leaned on his side, coughing continuously and gasping for breath. I'm alive. The boy said in between breaths, not believing what happened. He thought that this was another cruel prank from the world, but the pain he felt and the sensation of his body working properly, proved him otherwise. I'm alive repeating again the same words, he slowly recovered his breath. I am alive. Howling at the heavens, he screamed with every fiber of his being. That last pawn piece was focused on his mental traumas. The pain he experienced from the last piece was focused on his mind. Since normal pain no longer worked on him, the last evil piece went towards his greatest weakness in that state. His mind. Truly worthy of the name evil piece. Aiming at the worst possible spot at the best timing possible. That thought sent a chill down his spine. Even if he couldn't move, he was alive. My vision is blurry. My senses are twisted. And my mind, well, just by the fact that I am speaking like this is proof enough that I'm not well. The dark brown haired boy thought to himself. Well, it seems that I need to wait. Since the procedure was done, I can finally use my aura to fix my body. After that, I need to go back to Kuo. There are things I need to do. He said to no one in particular. Ahahaha. <laughs> Let's see what awaits us. Now world, I'll show you what I'm made of. Issei said as a vicious grin adorned his entire face. I really do wonder what exactly will happen from now on. Thanks for watching this video. If you really enjoy this video. Like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification. Don't forget to support and follow iLulugal for writing that awesome fanfic, and also make sure to comment on this story link in the description. See you in the next video. Goodbye.